Hello and welcome. This is the second episode of the Geotech Hour. It is my honor to greet you. We have a very august panel here today to join us for part two of a series in which we're looking at Western societies at the crossroads. And this second part is now thinking about China, thinking about India, thinking about engagement with all parts of Asia, as well as other parts of the world in thinking about how we move forward with data, tech, and people in a way that is reaffirming for how we do this. If you missed it, I highly recommend you check our part one, Western Societies at the Crossroads, which was last week, in which we examined what we could do with data, tech, and people for the way forward. Now, I'm excited to welcome our panel, who is going to think about how we can actually move forward with smart partnerships, again, engaging Asia as we move forward in data and AI efforts. First, I wanna welcome Matt. Matt, if you could share a little bit about yourself and also what we did with the Smart Partnership Series this year, which is supported by the Rockefeller Foundation and what you found over the last year of discussions with different officials around the world regarding China, data, and AI. Welcome, Matt. Well, thanks, David. And just uh, to give a short introduction, I'm the Director of Foresight Strategy and Risk Initiative in is what I was producing. So it's um, sponsored by the Rockefeller Foundation looking at China and AI, but industry, business finding from it was really the worries about bipolarity. I mean, this, we started in 2019 in Paris, Huawei, China tech companies, uh, like Huawei, um, and hoping to buy into um, the uh, Chinese tech uh, for really worry of how, how this was going to impact the science and also the humanitarian um, developmental way. Um, Europe, because of their market power that they could help bring both sides together by enforcing norms, weaknesses, because it wasn't the place where you had the giant uh, tech companies. Industry people that we backfill and make China stronger, much more independent, um, less dependent on the US. In the US, it was a divided opinion. The administration very strongly, as I indicated in the very first meeting in Paris, warning everybody against um, China, but you public, private sector totally opposed um, to what was happening and looking for ways again at cooperation. Uh, and this was, we had leaders of uh, universities like Carnegie Mellon uh, was represented, uh, but also the um, businesses themselves who had big interests in, in China. Um, now, India and uh, Africa roundtables talked about not, most of the participants talked about not being caught up. I mean, they were struggling to actually take advantage of AI um, and were, were really not wanted, didn't want to be forced into the US fold or the Chinese fold. And in fact, saw themselves with special problems, um, basically that, that were not replicated in the US and China. So their idea was actually building governance capacity, um, would look for help for both for Europe, US and China, but also with each other. Now there were a couple of recommendations. I mean, and um, I don't wanna go on too long, but I'll just um, talk about a couple, one was basically establishing a, a baseline um, in the same way that the, within the UN, you have a uh, effort to look at climate change and establish what are the facts of climate change. This would be an international effort to actually think about uh, AI and then also use the principle, AI principles that Basically, you know, each US, EU, various European countries as well, China have all put out these principles. They're very similar. So using those principles actually to build some agreement on 
implementation. So narrowing kind of the practice um, between the, the big players. Um, and then sharing, ability to share successes and failures. I mean, this was a big one for um, participants in the African and Indian roundtables, thinking about how they could learn from others, um, could help actually speed their effort up to, to uh, using AI for good. And then, as I said, for them to building up government capacity where they didn't see the governments as actually well poised to help entrepreneurs in, in the developing world. So I'll stop there. I mean, bottom line here is, is real trepidation about what is happening at the geopolitical level and that undermining actually the potential for, for AI and data. Excellent. Uh, thank you for that, Matt. And, 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 and if I could ask you a real quick rejoinder <laughs> for a brief thought. <clears throat> you know, you, you talked about, you, you know, you have a very impressive background doing foresight for the national security community. If someone was to approach you and say, well, what's the value of having a track two dialogue, a value of trying to find ways to collaborate when there's clearly competition going on? I mean, since, since the events that you talked about, we've seen things ratchet up with involving WeChat and, and TikTok and things like that. If you had to give a short, maybe 30 second pitch as to why is there value in exploring track two dialogues? Uh, what would you say? Because the, the real value is that governments don't have the, the time or oftentimes the inclination about thinking about alternative solutions. And obviously, you know, you it may not, the results of track two may not have instantaneous buy-in by any of the governments, but over time as their own efforts lead to failure, or you know, they can look and here's ready-made um, solutions that they can adopt and they don't have to you know, cast about to try to find some sort of solution. Also, the personal connections are very important. We've seen it with COVID, where American scientists who actually have an in with Chinese scientists have been able to get information out much quicker. Hmm. And that's really what we should be thinking about are getting those networks established. Excellent. Thank you very much, Matt. I'd now like to turn to Ambassador Schaefer. Ambassador, if you could real quick introduce yourself and, and Matt sort of teed it up for you, which is, you know, Europe's looking for a third way and, and there's obviously these geopolitical tensions. Uh, if you could both introduce yourself and, and maybe share your thoughts, is there a third way? Uh, what should we be thinking about? Well, thank you very much, David. Uh, I'm Michael Schaefer. Uh, I have been um, a long-term German diplomat. Uh, I was a six years ambassador uh, to China uh, between 2007 and 2013. And since then, I'm chairman of the BMW Foundation, which is also trying to work in the direction of responsible leadership uh, between uh, actors uh, from politics, business, uh, and civil society. Coming to your question, I think we all feel uh, this is a watershed moment for European-Chinese relations, as it is probably for everyone else. And we are looking at a picture which I would um, uh, describe as extremely complex. It is not black and white. It is not either or. I think this is, um, so to say, requiring a policy which is based on principles, which is based on power, but which is also based on the willingness to engage uh, and, and to cooperate. So I think our relationship with uh, China, I would put under three main headings. China is an important strategic partner. B, China is increasingly a strategic competitor. And obviously, and this is not new, there is a systemic rivalry. But this is a rivalry which, so to say, derives from uh, our different system, which is not new. And I don't see a, a necessity 
of engaging in an aggressive policy, neither uh, from the Western side, from the European side, there's no willingness, nor from the Chinese side. Shortly, to explain these, these three approaches, partnership, clearly, we are the largest trading partners for each other, by far, much further than with the US. Uh, I think this requires increasingly a level playing field. And this is exactly where cooperation gets into competition. China needs to understand that, uh, so to say, becoming uh, or getting out of the position of junior partner and becoming uh, a, a partner at eye level, it needs to respond in reciprocal terms than we offer our market, which means market access, no force technology transfer, reciprocity in, in dealing uh, with all important issues. Those are the opening doors uh, for partnership. If that does not happen, uh, Europe will, and you can see this at the, the latest uh, virtual, um, um, virtual uh, um, uh, summit, which we have had last Sunday. Can you still hear me? Yes, we can still hear you. You're because I don't see you anymore. Okay. Oh, well, we see um, you. Which you could see. <laughs> uh, if that happens, if China does not respond in a positive way, which it looks like at the moment, Europe will develop uh, a, some sort of a more engaging, tough industrial policy. Hmm. There will be aid for European companies if the competition is unfair due to subsidies to state-owned companies. Public procurement is open in Europe, but only if that is true for European companies in China as well. Same is true for protecting strategic high-tech environment. And here we are at this question, how do we react to uh, data and, and in particular to AI? I think Europe and European governments are still so to say, uh, uh, in, in, in the forefront of making a decision if digital autonomy, as we call it, is an option. But this is something which I see coming. We will design a policy which will try to make Europe uh, autonomous with respect to China, but also with respect to other players as, so to say, domestic security is concerned. In those areas, we are going to uh, be much more, uh, let me say, uh, protective of European interest. The same is true to key areas <clears throat> uh, like car batteries, cloud computing. Uh, we have these Gaia-X uh, developments. So what you will see is more, um, let me say, sound and, and uh, tough European positioning. I see, and this is my last remark, I see an increasing geopolitical triangle. Mm -hmm. Triangle US, EU, and China. That does not mean equidistance. Europe has more in common with the US in terms of values and interests, but we do not share uh, uh, all approaches. We are not interested in a hegemonic conflict uh, with China, uh, but we will be trying, as I explained, to balance our approaches with responses from the other side. So we will see partnership uh, and uh, competition in important areas. In particular, in building a global uh, legal system uh, which is based on rules, we will need China, as by the way, we, re we will need the United States. Same is true for climate change. Combat against climate change needs all these actors and Europe is willing and resolved to engage uh, also with China uh, on these scores. Uh, last sentence, I think we have reason to be self-confident. Uh, Europe has much more leverage than it sometimes thinks. Uh, we will offer partnership 
where possible, but competition where necessary. And if there is a systemic rivalry, we are not going to engage in ideological, uh, so to say, beauty contests, uh, <laughs> but we will see that principles are upheld. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Ambassador, for those remarks. I look forward to circling back to you a little bit later because I'd be interested in your perspectives, given that uh, Germany did experience, you know, during the Cold War, the tensions between the Soviet Union and the United States, and and, and fortunately that didn't get hot, uh, or at least not not to a noticeable level. Yes. So I'll be interested later in your thoughts about okay. how we can avoid that. I uh, would like to also now welcome Asha to the show. Asha, you have a very impressive background as well, and your foundation has been doing a lot of work to encourage entrepreneurs and entrepreneurship around the world. Real quick, if you could introduce uh, to our audience who you are and what you do, and then would be interested in your perspectives on, on, on what both India is possibly seeing in this whole, um, whole uh, uh, puzzle that we're trying to figure out, as well as what our entrepreneurs seeing in this whole puzzle too. So thank you for inviting me, David. Uh, my name is Asha Jadeja. I'm um, I'm actually, believe it or not, in my past life, an international uh, relations person, political scientist out of Stanford, actually an academic, Excellent. Uh, turned venture capitalist based in Silicon Valley and based in the Bay Area. And uh, all my uh, investments in tech companies, uh, I have over 200 startups. These are all in Silicon Valley. So to be honest, my... Um, uh, my, um, you know, my entry into India is still is evolving. I'm not yet fully, you know, familiar with the whole Indian entrepreneurial uh, landscape yet. Uh, but I'm slowly beginning to get a sort of a hang of it as uh, as India starts, um, you know, uh, asking some of the Chinese companies to leave, and that's creating um, an unprecedented venture capital opportunity for all of us in the Bay Area to be investing in some of these uh, companies which are rivals to let's say TikTok or uh, 59 other apps that have been asked to leave. And I feel that, um, so my view into India is that of a, of a venture capitalist who's looking for opportunities for growth. Uh, that said, <clears throat> my, uh, uh, my... We seem to have briefly lost Asha. Hopefully her internet connection will come back. I'm going to segue briefly to Julian, and then if Asha does come back, uh, Julian will switch back to her, but we seem to have uh, briefly lost uh, her connection. But Julian, if you could share real quick, I know you helped with Matt and the efforts with the roundtables. It would be great if you could share your perspectives as to what were you hearing, particularly uh, since we were talking a little bit about India, but also with Africa, what were we hearing uh, from those regions regarding this, this sort of Tug of, uh, tug of war, which hopefully doesn't become a hot war uh, in regarding China, data and AI and the West. Sure, um, yeah, thanks so much, David. Um, as you said, um, I've, I've been privileged enough to work with Matt on those roundtables. Uh, it was a project that um, I first started working on when coming at the Atlantic Council, and I'm now um, a resident fellow at both the Geotech Center and the Foresight Strategy and Risk. Um, so I think I wanna make three uh, quick points. Um, I think one of, the main themes that we heard uh, from the experts particular that we talked to during those roundtables was the potential disruptive effects of um, um, emerging technologies. Whether we think about the future of work, future of health, um, future of data, um, artificial intelligence and other emerging technologies really have um, an impact that um, might be not known to societies or on the scale of the industrialization uh, or other major events. So international governance on the issue, or at least international cooperation, is extremely important. Yet we're seeing the exact opposite, as Matt and Ambassador Chef have both uh, alluded to. And particularly in the United States, I think we see a securitization of emerging technologies. Um, Ambassador Chef, one of his first points was that, you know, the, the economic um, relationship between um, Germany and China uh, and Europe as a whole uh, while in the United States, most of those conversations are seen purely from a national security angle, which of course changes the complete uh, changes the discussion completely. Uh, so I think when we did those talks uh, all around the world, it was very interesting to see that basically everybody agreed on the potential disruption that comes with emerging technologies, yet everybody defined it through different lenses, which obviously makes the conversation um, rather difficult. And the last point, which I think is important in that regard is, I think the conversation about China really started at a point in which 
Western societies, in particular the, America, the United States, is also questioning itself. Um, you know, Americans once uh, believed that the, their country's power is, is limitless, and now um, we see uh, that many question the role the United States should play in the world. Uh, and I think to some extent, um, China has become somewhat of a scapegoat on blaming a lot of the negative externalities of globalization, whether that is you know, deindustrialization or shifting from a production based to a service based or automated society. Um, and we all remember um, Trump's campaign slogan, um, and yet again, uh, reinventing that narrative. While actually one could make the case that it was emerging technologies that were responsible for a lot of the replacement of jobs of traditional labor, uh, the Rust Belt um, that, that uh, swayed the election. So I think we really, we did, we're discussing the role of China, the rise of China at a time where Western societies, as the title indicates, are at a crossroads. Um, and start to question their own role in the world. Um, and I'll maybe end, end with that, um, with what I started. I think the real problem here is that the discussion is um, defined by different lenses that different stakeholders are looking at it. And to just reiterate what Matt and I uh, heard when we traveled uh, to China in January was the Chinese don't necessarily see that as a rise of the People's Republic, they rather see it as a restoration. Right. You know, it's a culture that's uh, more than, you know, centuries old um, and they always had their place in the world. And it will be interesting to see whether the United States, who has been used to hegemony for quite some time, especially in the post-World War II era, um, can actually adapt to a situation where they're not purely the sole hegemon anymore, but there is uh, another player uh, in international politics. Excellent. And uh, Julian, you were also very modest. You, you helped uh, get the Geotech Center started, and we are indebted for that. You are a Geotech Fellow 001, uh, inaugural fellow. So thank you for everything that you do. I think we have Asha back by phone. Asha, I think for whatever reason, Zoom is not auto-rotating, so you may need to do portlet mode, but you are back. So hopefully your audio is working. And if we can welcome you back, you were giving us your thoughts about, from a Silicon Valley perspective, about everything that's going on with this puzzle. So I welcome you back and Asha, if you could share your thoughts. So I think, uh, so David, once again, I'm a venture capitalist based in the Bay Area and uh, have been investing largely in the Bay Area, but I'm just dipping my toes in India now. And uh, part of the reason for looking at venture capital as a, as a VC into Indian entrepreneurship is really driven by the fact that a lot of the apps, massive opportunities like TikTok, I asked to leave in, and I think that is creating a, a huge opportunity for not just myself, for most mainstream market, the 1.3 billion strong, uh, you know, market there. So, uh, so that said, with uh, you know, I, I feel that as the world moves from sort of a stable unipolar, uh, unipolar political order, to something that's a dynamic, multipolar, multilateral uh, political and economic order. Technology is probably going to be one of the most important drivers for establishing these track to dialogues and uh, uh, relationships, which can come in handy uh, before anybody presses the red button. Hmm. So I think it's crucial that we understand the strategic, the strategic geopolitical role of technology now. It's not just about Huawei and uh, TikTok being asked to uh, depart, but I think it's uh, it's much more about tying our hands in a very self-conscious kind of a way so that our uh, cooperation and competition remains uh, sort of healthy, market-friendly, and remains more or less stable. Uh, in this multipolar world of ours, uh, there is no way we can afford to have the clash of uh, values and civilizations that uh, people used to forecast once upon a time. <laughs> it's not the Samuel Huntington world anymore. This is a world where uh, Chinese citizens or Indian citizens or anybody even in Ukraine or Belarus, as we are seeing now, are all speaking the same language of, uh, of freedom and values. And uh, 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 part of the reason for that is because we are bound together by uh, massive technologies like the internet, uh, like cloud computing, like data, like AI. And uh, so uh, as, as a nation state, it's crucial that governments understand that uh, these are tools, data, AI, information gathering, uh, even, even blockchain for that matter. These are extremely important 
uh, platforms that can enable partnerships that will strengthen these track two dialogues um, and and um, and actually um, I frankly don't even see them as track two dialogues. You know, when we see, for example, Oracle. Uh, betting on uh, taking a certain stake in TikTok, it's really not just an economic, uh, uh, you know, play that we are talking about. It's a pretty important uh, tying of hands between two major uh, geopolitical situations, and and I think this is something that uh, our governments will need to understand and be able to place it in the right context as we go forward. It's not just about President Trump picking up the phone and calling Satya uh, at Microsoft and saying, hey, can you take a stake in TikTok? No, it's not just that. Hmm. I think it's about understanding that these stakes that we have between multiple parties are tying our hands when you're talking in a you know, game theoretic kind of a scenario. They are tying hands of the, of the political leadership on taking unilateral actions that may not serve their own societies. So I think this is a very, uh, very, very powerful development that's happening and we need to be tracking it carefully and playing an extremely important role in nudging it in directions that we think is safer and better for the world. Excellent. And maybe if I could ask a real quick rejoinder, um, given your perspective as a very successful uh, investor and entrepreneur in, in Silicon Valley startups, um, it was back in 2015, I made a pitch that we should do an event on what Silicon Valley does not know about foreign policy will surprise us all. Uh, unfortunately, that wasn't picked up at the time because I think people who did foreign policy didn't understand how tech impacts foreign policy and vice versa. But maybe real quick, if you give us maybe a 30 or 40 seconds, what's your take? What are the things that you think Silicon Valley does not understand about foreign policy that they should understand? Silicon Valley is hitting the ground running, David on beginning to understand the power of what it means to be uh, a Google or a Facebook uh, that is spanning uh, multinational boundaries, right? So these are entities now that can bring down governments and uh, we know it. Uh, so this is not something that's new. I think it, this conversation has been brewing for the last couple of years at the very least. There are some excellent uh, dialogues that have been taped and put up on, on um, at Aspen Institute, which I think they have some excellent conversations about how in a post-nation state world, mm -hmm. how are these agencies, how are these entities like the, like the Googles and the Facebooks, how are they beginning to play sort of a, a role that uh, can span multi-government international um, you know, entities and what, uh, what, so, so the, I, I think as far as the Valley goes, people are very aware of, uh, where this is all heading. I, I, I have a feeling that there's a little bit of um, a frustration about um, you know, understanding if, if everybody is on the same page in Washington, DC or in Beijing. Uh, but uh, that's something that um, is, is uh, I think from Washington, DC, there is enough presence now of the State Department entities and even CIA. The CIA uh, you know, has a proper venture capital fund going on in Silicon Valley called InQtel. Mm -hmm. And these guys are investing in startups. So, so I think there is a recognition now in Washington DC that that uh, that, that the valley is of, of too much of a geopolitical significance now to not engage in a in, in a strategic dialogue. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Asha. Really appreciate that insight as to what's going on, and that actually sets us up now. So now, for panelists, we're at about half half an hour in. We have another half hour for the Geotech Hour. We're going to go to a little bit more of a lightning round format. So it's more sort of like looking for 30 or 40 seconds short, short answers. I'm going to go first to Ambassador Schaefer, because we, Schaefer, we were setting up the phase, phase that we we're looking for ways to collaborate more. And Asha just was talking about the perspective of entrepreneurs. So I guess I'd be interested in terms of <clears throat> what's Europe's perspectives about how do we encourage entrepreneurs either based in Europe, but also possibly based in China or the United States to all work together in a way that, that sort of respects sort of the norms that Europe is trying to put in place, the principles? Well, I think this is uh, an extremely important but uh, difficult uh, question to answer. Um, Julian has alluded to a very important point, and that was mind frame. Mm -hmm. I think what people in Western societies, in business, but also in politics, need to understand is that there is a Chinese mind frame which uh, derives from uh, 150 years of humiliation, internal conflict, uh, so to say, 
uh, a society which broke physically and psychologically to the extent that it was almost diminished. And what he said, coming back to where it was in the middle of the 19th century, is exactly on the mind of most Chinese I have met. So recognizing at least that there is a necessity uh, to acknowledge a huge, important uh, culture and civilization to become an accepted part of the international community is important. But on the other hand, China has gotten used to being the junior partner, to having an asymmetric uh, playing field. Mm -hmm. But now it has surpassed uh, Western uh, um, business and, uh, and, uh, and uh, societies in certain areas, tech areas. And I think it's very important to understand that they need now to recognize they have to do more in order to get back to a level playing field. It's not a symmetry anymore, which uh, is the basis for, for doing business. And so I think this uh, mutual change in mind frames is the uh, precondition for getting into a better dialogue. And then what Matt said in the beginning, track two is only possible if you talk to each other. We are always talking about each other. Right. <laughs> the Europeans and Americans and Indians, like today, we are talking about the Chinese. There's no Chinese in our conversation tonight. I think that doesn't make sense. If we want to come into, so to say, um, a mode of uh, trying to sort out where cooperation is possible, we need discourse and dialogue with each other. And that's why track two cannot be just, so to say, uh, Western plus uh, democratic societies like India or Japan or Australia or others um, with each other, but we need to have that conversation with China. Uh, and this conversation cannot be political. Political organizations are incapable of doing the trick. Asha has uh, very eloquently showed us what the tech element will be in the future. It will have an increased influence on all of these developments, internal and external developments. But also other parts of, of society will have a very strong impact. And that's why I think politics, business, and civic society need to be part of this track two effort to understand where do we have convergent interests. We will have less convergent values, but we have convergent interests. China is an interest-driven country. Right. It is not as ideological as many people think. The communist label is there, yes. But what drives China's decisions is really the interest to do everything possible to get Chinese, uh, so to say, business uh, uh, be, uh, to be successful and get people out of poverty and, and have them participate in, in the growth. And that is, so to say, where I think uh, collaboration can start because interest-based cooperation is something which we all can adjust to. And so I think it's important to look for converging interests and less for divergent ideologies. Very well said. And I think that's where, again, we want to give thanks to our, 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 our supporters with the Rockefeller Foundation who actually put the, for, put, put the funding forward for the last year for what Matthew, uh, Matt and Julian were doing in terms of having conversations with China and also having conversations with China in different regions around the world. Because I agree with you, we need to be talking with each other. And maybe you actually just threw down the gauntlet that we need to have a part three in which possibly we are actually having this conversation with China. So I look forward to uh, engaging you all for a part three of this series as well. Um, Asha, I'm going to now pivot to you and, and similarly sort of thinking about, you know, are there opportunities for India, given it's both its proximity to China, um, given it's also the fact that I think in population it's going to eventually uh, meet, if not exceed, the same number of people that China has. Could India be a broker, given that it is a democracy and it's also close to China, could it help the West 
figure out how it's going to make this work uh, in this changing world. So I'd be interested in your thoughts there, Asha. So India has tried to be a broker for a long time because of proximity to China and because of having had, uh, you know, we still already, I think India has enormous trade relationships with China right now. And uh, most large Indian business houses have production and uh, manufacturing facilities in China. Uh, so it has, uh, you know, already been a, a broker to some extent. However, the recent uh, developments, as we all know, on the on the you know the, on the sort of the border clashes, is something that has taken everybody by surprise. Mm. And I think uh, in the Indian political circles, people have not been able to put uh, uh, you know put a finger on sort of what, how exactly to be dealing with uh, with with the border clashes and and how to bring in maybe third party uh, you know uh, partners to broker that peace on the on the border now the reason the border issue is so important for india right now is because the border is in kashmir and kashmir has been a contested zone for too long and too much of indian security is at stake given that there is also uh, history with pakistan there as you know on the, on the kashmir front so i think the border issue right now has tinied all kinds of um, you know initiatives on the Indian side to be to be a partner with China to be a broker between um, uh, between the U.S. and China. This, unfortunately, over the last year or two, what I've been seeing is that India has become increasingly wary of uh, Chinese uh, uh, movements on the border and has started actually initiating um, a deeper connection between the Quad, which is India, China, sorry, India, U.S., Japan, and Australia. Mm -hmm. And that worries me a little bit because that is something if the quad deepens and uh, if, uh, you know, bilateral conversations between India and China get diluted through by, by you know, India becoming more, uh, more engaged with the quad, I think we are going to look at um, a situation where uh, India will have lesser role to play as, as a broker between between US and China. And uh, and my fear right now, David, is that it's heading in that direction. Hmm. Uh, yeah, I think I, I'm not sure how, you know, probably the ambassador and some of you there know more about where things might be heading on the border clashes. But right now the geopolitical security issues are uh, are weighing India down heavily on this on this front. Very well said. So maybe if I could ask you a real quick rejoinder and then I'm gonna to go to Matt and Julian, but real quick, I know your foundation and your work, you, you've been focusing on, on what entrepreneurs can do involving data and tech. And we've talked a little bit about agritech, which of course there's huge potential with India, but there's also other partners involving possibly Israel, possibly UAE. And this is something that may be getting back to what the ambassador was saying, you know, we all care about certain things and I think we all care about feeding our people. So maybe Asha, if you'd be willing to share a little bit of thoughts about, you know, are there things that entrepreneurs and startups can do to address these sort of shared interests like agritech or other things like that um, from Silicon Valley or from other parts of the world as well? So entrepreneurs, look, the good news with entrepreneurs is that they're looking for business, right? They're looking for business growth and they're looking for uh, partnerships that can enable that kind of growth. So that's, that's fantastic. It, it doesn't care about too many other things right now. Entrepreneurship is about getting, uh, getting your company up and running, making profits, going public, and uh, you know, partnering with other um, like-minded entities. As far as agri-tech goes, there is a lot of uh, uh, you know, partnerships brewing already between India and Israel. A lot of Israeli startups are partnering with Indian startups on agri-tech and on uh, solar, uh, perhaps even on water purification. <laughs> but um, uh, the on, on the you know on data, data security, and and things like that. Uh, again, David, much as I would like to be a positive sort of uh, you know uh, <laughs> you know uh, bringer of news here, I actually think that on data, data security, and AI. Unfortunately, uh, there has been there has been a greater uh, sense of partnerships going on between uh, India, Israel, and the U.S. Mm -hmm. and uh, and more of a of a move where where Indian, Israeli, and U.S. startups are pulling out of uh, China partnerships. That said, uh, I have to say that there is a tremendous amount of venture capital in, uh, interest from uh, from China into Indian startups. And so we are seeing lots of investments coming in from, uh, you know, not just venture capital, but also from Alibaba, 
from the Alibabas of China. They are coming in and in taking, you know, a massive stake in companies like Flipkart and, uh, uh, you know, a Snapchat and th- a Snap uh, Snap Deal and things like that. So there is, you know, there is movement going on from China. There's a lot of foreign direct investment coming in from China into India, but. Uh, but as far as entrepreneurship goes, uh, that's that's something that uh, with with Huawei being um, asked to leave certain zones, uh, I, th- I think there is a, there is some amount of uh, trepidation right now about what uh, we you know what what a company should be investing in or what should be partnering with with China if next year there's going to be a, a fallout. So companies entrepreneurs are becoming wary about partnering right now. And that's a sad thing because I think companies uh, like Baidu and Alibaba have strong synergies uh, with companies in India. And I just hope that those partnerships grow stronger. Very helpful. Appreciate that, Asha. And very, very, very interesting insights as to both the opportunities and challenges ahead. So, so Matt, I'm going to now turn to you uh, again. Your, your impressive background doing foresight and working with the national security community. You know, when we were looking at a previous Cold War between the Soviet Union and the United States, I mean, I don't think there was really much talk about companies that would span both 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 countries, which is obviously different now. So it would be interesting in your thoughts about how can we make sure that's a strength as a way as opposed to pulling us apart that those companies may help us find ways to work together. And then two, if you have any thoughts about what we can do to make sure things don't get even more heated or, or ways that we can actually de-escalate some of these conflicts. Well, thanks, David, for the difficult question. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I'm throwing hand grenades here, so. <laughs> um, <laughs> On the second one, uh, which is, you know, how to ensure that we don't slide even more into a bipolar world, I would say that the immigration question uh, is key, and I don't want to get into all that. I mean, you know, there's a bigger part of the immigration question on the undocumented, um, you know, uh, immigrants in the in the U.S., but what we've seen lately is universities get visits by FBI agents um, who want the universities to track Chinese students. They want them to pro- prohibit Chinese students from um, studying in different sectors. Um, and I think this is, you know, this is how you get speedily into a, another Cold War. You know, it's a huge advantage for the U.S. that you have lots of Chinese students who come. Uh, we have not maximized those advantages. We send them back too quickly, don't allow them to, and this goes for all immigrants, actually get, get jobs, get more rooted. But, you know, just having that knowledge of the U.S. is a huge advantage. And for the U.S., having the world's talent here is a huge advantage. Similarly, I think, and President Obama tried to do this, is really up the number of U.S. students, Americans who go to China. So that you, you know, getting back to what Ambassador Schiffer and Julian were talking about, where you have much more comprehension of China, you really need to do that with people-to-people exchanges. And, um, you know, we don't teach enough about world history in our classes, in primary, secondary school um, history, and all those soft subjects are not, you know, in, in uh, favor at the moment for, for students in universities, so they don't really understand China or its history or anything. So I think um, that is, that's the one thing I would say as a recommendation on your first on the, you know, I think having companies, which is totally, you know, in the actual Cold War, you had an economic division and you didn't have those exchanges. Um, I think we should encourage, I mean, it, you know, first place, Asia, China's, is going to be, and also includes India, is going to be the place that's growing. It's where U.S. companies should be uh, active in if they want to remain global leaders. We have seen over the last decade, if you look at the, you know, Fortune 500, global Fortune 500 companies, more and more are Chinese. 
where the U.S. used to have that total monopoly <clears throat> on those top spots, that that is going. I mean, we they need to be operating in the places where there is growth. And that means China, but that also means other countries in India. And over time, it also means Africa, where a lot more European com companies operating in Africa than the US companies. So we should be really encouraging that and not throwing as many obstacles. I mean, the national security community should not be throwing as many obstacles as they, they look like they, they intend to do. Thank you, Matt. That's very helpful. And, and that's a good segue to, so Julian, uh, I'm going to go to you before we get ready for the lightning round to wrap up. Um, we are about, to, we've got about 15 minutes left, 12 minutes left. Um, interested, Julian, in your thoughts, because you, you, you've seen the arc of this and you've been working with the Geotech Center. It, it was interesting that, you know, both both the ambassador and, and Asha were, were sharing that there were things that it seems like we could collaborate on, like we can collaborate possibly on food, we can collaborate possibly on water. And, and maybe these are things that for some examples, you know, they're either abundant or they could be abundant, or they can't necessarily be, be, be weaponized in ways that maybe say data, on the other hand, we don't see collaboration on data, or we don't see necessary collaboration on security. And if you look at sort of like what the concerns were with Huawei and some of the other ones, it seemed like these were things that we worried might be weaponized or, or, or have security risks. So, so, so recognizing that you're looking at this both from a geopolitical perspective and also a data and tech perspective, you know, how would you recommend even beginning to try and figure out what would those things that we could do that, that, that we can collaborate on that are not necessarily as contentious as some other things and, and how, how to sort that out uh, as we try to figure out ways we can collaborate in a world in which there's also competition? Well, I think the ambassador alluded um, to that um, important point in his uh, previous remark. I think it really comes down to trust. Um, if you are having a conversation um, with a partner that you don't trust, it's very hard to find any kind of agreement uh, on any sorts of issues. Uh, and I think this is of particular importance um, when it comes to thinking about uh, alternative futures, right? I mean, Matt has taught me a great deal on foresight and, and foresight is not necessarily about predicting the future. It's rather about thinking strategically about different scenarios um, or circumstances, therefore. And I think when we really are moving into a world uh, where political activities dictate economic activities um, into like some sort of new bipolarity, have those people who are advocating for such an approach really thought through what that actually means in its consequences. Um, what does that mean if supply chains have to move out, move out of China? Um, what does it mean if there's no military um, communication even in the South China Sea? Uh, and is the potential for conflict uh, therefore so large that we should rather think about alternatives um, and, and strategic decisions that need to be made now um, in order to prevent a, a, a bipolarity or even a descent into chaos, as, as Matt points out in his um, global risk reports. Um, and I think, I mean, I, I'm a person who has uh, both studied in China and the United States, so uh, <laughs> that certainly uh, expands the, um, the experiences that uh, I was lucky enough to make. And um, it, it really kind of comes down to the question that I think with the speed at which emerging technologies are developing, um, they are already somewhat applied into military tactics. So I think the time to act and to build this trust that both Ambassador Schaeffer and, and I was now mentioning is really crucial now because I think there might be a break even point where there is, it's very, very hard to, to move back to trust building measures to uh, reversing the deglobalization or the deintegration. Um, so yeah, having those conversations, um, finding interests um, within the global community. I mean, this is what, what makes this entire situation so unfortunate is that all of those problems, whether the emerging tech or climate change or um, questions about um, agri-tech or food security, they're global questions and they require global solutions. And we see a reversal um, that, you know, Western societies are moving back into the nation state and, and think that they can solve the problems alone. Um, so even if the United States wants to bring in uh, the Europeans, wants to bring in um, other partners around the world, uh, I think it would be much more successful to bring them in within a multilateral framework um, that I think China ultimately wants to preserve. I mean, it has benefited hugely from its integration into the WTO, um, from, from, uh, from the liberal international 
uh, order. And it really reminds me of, of, of one of the quotes that we heard actually from a Chinese participant who was very well connected. It was a meeting in Berlin um, that Ambassador Sheffer was, was partially uh, participating in as well. And he said the Chinese might have been allowed to play at the high table, but they were always reminded who owns the casino. Mm. Um, so it is, I think, a question of, of respect and a question of trust. And um, I really hope for the sake of um, the future that, that um, governments and, and decision makers are able to move there. Excellent. Uh, and, and so now we're at the lightning round. We've got about uh, six minutes left and, and I'm actually going to take your metaphor of, of a casino and maybe shift instead of thinking about world fairs, which we used to do. And we even did the world fairs during the Cold War. There's supposedly a story in which there was a world fair expo that was hosted in the United States and the U.S. exhibit was right next to the Soviet exhibit. And it turned out that the U.S. exhibit was, you know, somewhere between six to 12 inches taller than the Soviet exhibit. And so at night, <laughs> the Soviets came in and they actually elevated their exhibit by another foot so it could be taller than the US exhibit. But if that's the form of competition we're doing, that's probably fine. So, so maybe what we need to think about is what are smart partnerships like a World Fair Expo that we can do? And, and really looking for very short tweet links answers because we have a limit of time, but I'm gonna go first to Julian, then to Matt, then to Asha, and then to Ambassador Sheffer. Uh, Julian, if you were to recommend sort of one or two takeaways for public and private sector leaders, what would you recommend for smart partnerships going forward? I think there are two things that I would, would say, one more general, um, which I think that, you know, the success of international politics is not necessarily how to uh, cope with allies, but it's rather how to solve conflict with those who you disagree. And the tweet length answer for smart partnerships is uh, probably recognizing interest um, and identifying shared goals uh, and work towards them so that trust uh, can eventually expand uh, to areas of disagreement. Excellent, well said and look forward to seeing what we can do to help continue this. And again, very thankful to our partners with Rockefeller Foundation for all their support. Uh, Matt, your thoughts as well as what we can do with smart partnerships. Well, I think uh, this has been alluded to before, but I think the, the resource issues are key. Um, food, water, and also energy, getting to renewable energy. I mean, those would be, you know, at the top of my list. Um, particularly, I think it would get the U.S. back into thinking about helping the developing world. Um, and certainly science is right at the forefront and the technologies, you know, in the last global trends I did, I mean, we worked with some people in Silicon Valley looking at a lot of these dealing with agriculture, um, water, clean water, drinking water, urban design. I mean, those things I think um, would be maybe gets us away a little bit uh, from the national security um, issues uh, and also doing them together. That's a way maybe of creating some momentum towards, you know, thinking about cooperation, just not about competition or rivalry. Excellent. And I like you, I like how you say, you know, think about doing it together. You know, again, we may have different ideologies, that's okay, but what can we do to do a journey together? And given that food and water seem to be some of the world's biggest problems, uh, biggest problems, maybe we take some of those and we try to figure out how we can solve them together. So, so thank you for yeah, that. Yeah, they're, bor they're borderless uh, issues. I mean, right. just all water. I mean, you you can't just deal on one country. It's usually a regional, if not broader, the, even the the region. Yes, very well said. Thank you. Uh, so, Asha, your thoughts if you were to make recommendations to public sector policy leaders, private sector leaders, what can we do to encourage more smart partnerships together on the road ahead? I would say there are two vectors, David, along which we all could be putting in the effort in creating uh, smart partnerships. One is towards restoring soft power for China. Ch given that China already has a huge infrastructure of uh, institutions like the Confucius centers all over US universities, lots and lots of lobby groups, China already is, is struggling and is making an effort to restore its, uh, its cultural soft power. I think we should leverage that existing infrastructure. The second vector is blockchain. Uh, given that there's already a huge uh, uh, you know, action going on, there's already a huge established set of relationships in the civil society of the, of, uh, of the planet. 
on blockchain, but it's just the Chinese, the Indians, the Americans, we are all there. And for a change, blockchain, blockchain doesn't belong to the US or to Europe alone. It belongs to the world. Hmm. And it's a very powerful neutral platform along which uh, civil societies of all these nations could be uh, building a, you know, a relationship that can strengthen all of us for the long haul. So I think blockchain and soft power are two vectors that I like. Very interesting, and I, I would I think maybe that tees up for a future discussion, or maybe even a, 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 a we can do a video or a blog post. I would love to dive deeper with sort of unpacking what's involved with the immutable audit log of the blockchain and, and the fact that there's traceability and distributability. I mean, that easily could be another thing to unpack. So I appreciate that, Asha. That's that's a very interesting way of linking both the geopolitics with soft power and the technology capabilities when you think about immutable audit logs and, and distributed capabilities that could be there in terms of what does that mean in terms of how societies function. So I thank you for that. Uh, so Ambassador Sheffer, uh, what are your closing thoughts? Bring it home for us in terms of how can we pursue smart partnerships together? Well, looking at, at Europe and China, I would say we have to realize on both sides that China needs Europe as much as Europe needs China. A win-win situation requires respect for rules-based international system and fair practices from both sides. And that is a requirement which we do not see at the moment. If China does not understand that this is a requirement, it will not develop the trust and the soft power that Asha has been alluding to. And the second thing is, I think Europe will and should seek strategic partnership with China uh, on mutual interests. There are converging interests which are obvious, others need to be uh, identified. But it has to be done from a position of relative strength from the point of view of the, uni uh, of the Union uh, in Europe. We need to be united. And we need to develop uh, relative strength uh, in tech sector. And that's why I've said digital autonomy in the tech area uh, or in, in uh, um, important areas like 5G or cloud computing or uh, artificial intelligence is extremely important. On that basis, I see a host of opportunities engaging with China. Excellent. Well, thank you all. This has been a fascinating conversation. Really appreciate all your insights and expertise. To our audience, thank you for joining us, uh, both those of you who are watching this live and those who are going to be watching it later. Please remember, every Wednesday at 12 noon Eastern is the Geotech Hour. Our next episode three will focus on additive manufacturing, computer vision, and the application of AI. What are the national security as well as the supply chain ramifications of these global technologies? Also, you heard from our panelists the thoughts that we need to think about how we can use tech and data for good in the area of food and water. Please stay tuned for an announcement from the Geotech Center in November about what we're doing with Agritech. With that, I thank you all. Thank our panelists again for all you're doing as positive change agents and wish you a wonderful day. Take care.